start. Hey, good morning, uh, and welcome to the uh, session 2C on uh, global value chains, risks, and rewards of innovation. Uh, my name is Leonard Lane, and I am the director of the Fung Academy and the group director of leadership development at Lee and Fung, and uh, we'll be moderating the, uh, moderating the panel. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, talk about a piece of technology and innovation that we're going to be using during the course of the next 80 minutes. Uh, up on the, uh, the, sl the, uh, the screen over there, uh, we have an uh, individual from Lee and Fung, Aram Armstrong, who will be writing the headlines down. And uh, if you uh, would, uh, when, you fi uh, when we finish with, the, uh, with our time together, uh, you can go either follow FGI on Twitter or follow Aram Armstrong on Twitter, and you can download all of this. So as opposed to having PowerPoint slides and large documents to read, you can have something that just captures the headlines of the conversation that you can continue to annotate what you have that. So we believe that instead of just talking about innovation, we ought to practice a little bit of, of innovation in the digital economy uh, now that we're here. Uh, so let me begin by, uh, uh, by introducing uh, the focus of the, uh, focus of the panel. Uh, as the uh, program says, we're going to talk about the dimensions of innovation along global value chains from different sources and drivers. Uh, however, we're going to take a slightly different approach in this particular panel. Uh, the two previous panels on global value chains uh, have focused on costs, have focused on policy, and have basically focused on the uh, items of friction that are increasing transaction costs in the global value chain and what some of the things we can do to sort of decrease uh, the, the, that friction from a policy point of view. Uh, this particular panel is going to take a different view. Uh, we're going to talk about something that we call is additive to a global value chain. Uh, we all take the view that the uh, value chain, that uh, the way we operate in this world is a cross-border splitting of the value chain. Consequently, we have to talk about all the policy issues that are involved with that. But uh, embedded in all of that are people and organizations and culture. And this particular panel is going to really talk about the things that the people in the organizations can control, have controlled, and are doing uh, to, uh, uh, to increase uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the level of innovation in a value chain, what are some of the risks and rewards of that, and then what are some of the we call key learnings that you can take away that you're going to find up on the uh, board from, uh, as you follow us on Twitter. So let me introduce our, uh, uh, introduce our panelists. First, uh, on my left is, uh, is Dean uh, Samatraduta from, uh, uh, from Cornell. Uh, and he is the, uh, the Ann and Elmer Linseth Dean and Professor of Management at Samuel Curtis Johnson uh, Graduate School of Management at Cornell. His, his research is on uh, technology strategy and innovation policies at both the corporate and the national level. Uh, he's edited 13 annual global IT reports in the World Economic Forum and the Global Competitiveness Index. Uh, next to him is uh, Richard Kelly, one of my colleagues from uh, Lee and Fung, or from the Fung Group. Uh, Richard is uh, formerly the head of, uh, innovate, uh, head of IDEO Asia Pacific. Uh, IDEO, I think, as you well know, is known for their innovation experimentation. And uh, Richard, uh, basically, his job inside Lee and Fung is to lob, uh, light bonfires under Victor and all the rest of us uh, to begin to innovate and experiment a little bit more. Uh, next to uh, Richard is Professor Hao Lee from Stanford. Uh, Hao is probably one of the le world's leading uh, supply chain experts in terms of productivity, in terms of innovation, in terms of product development, uh, and edits quite a number of, uh, quite a number of publications uh, and is a solid practitioner in the field of, uh, of supply chain and also leads within Lee and Fung are uh, one of our senior leadership programs. Uh, uh, Sam Palomasano at the end of the uh, group here, and he's definitely the, on the last piece but not the least. Uh, you've already heard him and his view on competitiveness. He is the um, and former chairman of IBM, and we're delighted that all four of them can join us. So let me, uh, let me begin the panel on the way we're going to do this. I have an opening statement. Uh, then we're going to go down through each of the panelists. They'll have a view uh, and uh, a point of view on the statement. And then we'll, uh, we'll put it out to, to some questions in the audience. And then we'll summarize. And we recognize right now that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so we'll try to be on time. Uh, so with that, uh, my opening statement along the lines here of how do we build and leverage innovation in global value chains? Uh, what are the insights that our panelists have gathered, the trends they've been observing uh, that can inform our point of view? And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Duta.
Well, thank you very much. And I want to focus on those two words of innovation and global in my introductory comments. One of the research projects I'm engaged in every year for the last six years is something which is titled the Global Innovation Index. And you can access the report and all the data at a site called Global Innovation Index, one word, so globalinnovationindex.org.org. Now, my own research and innovation really started about maybe 10 years ago when I started looking at how technology was changing developmental strategies and driving different innovative strategies in different markets. And I noticed that if you went and looked at how countries were being measured in innovation, the metrics in innovation tended to be quite narrowly defined. And they usually tended to be more focused on aspects like patents, publications, PhDs, scientists, and similar variables. And on many of these variables, emerging markets were not faring very well. At the same time, I was noticing that there was a lot of innovation happening in emerging markets, which was not really getting captured adequately in this metrics and innovation that were more commonly used. So that was really the trigger at trying to come up with a new model of innovation that was more holistic, that was more broad-based, and that tried to capture innovation in multiple aspects and its different facets. So in the model of innovation, we have based our model on probably what is the most well thought out, well researched model of measurement and management, which is around total quality management. As we all know, total quality management has been around for more than 60 years. And if you look at most TQM models, they're based on the idea of inputs and outputs. They are things that a company does to become a quality organization, and then the outputs that are evidence of being a quality organization. So we applied the same kind of a model to innovation, and we have created a model of inputs, aspects that a country or a region should invest in to become innovative, and outputs, aspects that reflect the degree of innovative success of the country or region. Very briefly, there are five input pillars. The five input pillars are around institutions, around human capital, on infrastructure, on the business sophistication, and the market sophistication. Those are the five pillars in which a country needs to invest in to become innovative. And then there are two pillars of outputs. One pillar is the classical knowledge and technology outputs, which are more traditional science and technology oriented, patents, publications, and so on. And then there is another pillar called the creative outputs, the creative sectors. And we compute an index using all these different input and output variables to arrive at an overall measure of innovation. Now, let me share with you the results for this 2013. And I must say at the start that this is a joint collaboration across Cornell University, INSEAD, the business school where I was based previously, and WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva. Now this year, the top 10 countries are Switzerland, Sweden, UK, Holland, USA, Finland, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Denmark, and Ireland. And we have 140 countries included out there. Now, if you look at other metrics, we can also compute different ways on different perspectives in the data. You can look at, for example, what we term as innovation efficiency. So if you just divide output by input, so what's the degree of efficiency in converting inputs into outputs, you get a rather different list of countries out here. So the top 10 on the efficiency metrics this year are Mali, Moldova, Guinea, Malta, Swaziland, Indonesia, Nigeria, Kuwait, Costa Rica, and Venezuela. Now again, keep in mind these are independent of the level of innovation. So at any level of innovation, what's the success rate and conversion from a certain level of inputs into a certain level of outputs. Now, the different other models that you can actually, you can make and analyze this, and one of the analysis we do is in terms of comparison 
at the same GDP per capita level, which countries are outperforming and which countries are in fact underperforming other countries. And I'll just specify, you know, we divide the countries in three categories, uh, leaders, learners, and other countries that are underperforming. I will not focus on the leaders. Leaders are the usual leaders that I talked about earlier, the Western countries. But the learners are interesting. So we identified 11 learners in this research this year countries that are moving fast and are outperforming their peers relative to GDP per capita. The learners this year are Moldova, China, India, Uganda, Armenia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Jordan, Mongolia, Mali, Kenya, Senegal, Hungary, Georgia, Montenegro, Costa Rica, Tajikistan, and Latvia. Now, why do I give all these names because of these countries? I can give you more names of countries I just wanted to give you a sense that innovation measurement is a brutally hard topic. To actually look at how do you measure innovation, what are the boundaries of innovation is a very complex issue. And every year we go through very heated debate and discussion among different experts about what are the actual elements to include in the model. I can tell you, for example, uh, two years ago we decided to include an element in the creative sector which is focused on online creativity. A lot of people might actually argue whether or not online creativity is something that should be included in a country's measurement and innovation. But we do believe that a lot of individuals are now innovating online through a variety of blogs and other kinds of you know, various social media uh, elements. And to try to include that is an important element. At the same time, it's a choice that we make in terms of trying to identify the facets and the boundaries of innovation metrics in, in a certain country. Now, if you look at these different names I gave you, you start identifying names that are non-traditional names. Okay, so usually you might always hear of the Western names and Singapore and Hong Kong and, and Korea and Japan as the big leaders in innovation, and they are there as leaders in innovation. At the same time, you start identifying countries that are less known, less well recognized, and that are doing interesting things in some way or the other. Now, because the research, the research data is all based on hard data, there's no subjective elements out here, you can go in and you can actually question and say, well, why is Mali doing better than other countries at the same GDP per capita level? So you can actually go in and also do some kind of in-depth analysis. Now, if you're a company that gives you a basis for deciding what are also some of the risks and benefits in terms of making an investment and in innovation in some of these different countries, especially if looking at a global supply chain. So the number of different ways you can look at the data, but what I do believe is it gives you some kind of a little bit more evidence-based method at globalizing your supply chain, at looking at global innovation, and perhaps considering some countries and markets and regions like Africa that perhaps are not necessarily easily on the front radar screen for most, uh, let's say, uh, uh, companies and, and leaders in the space. Now, we have also other analysis to perform the data every year. And just to share with you some other, let's say, uh, interesting elements. So what we find is innovation clearly is a global game. In the first top 10 that I mentioned, you have North American uh, countries, you have European countries, you have uh, regions from, uh, from Asia. You find that some countries are moving very rapidly. So China is one example of a country that has moved very rapidly in the last four or five years. You also find Israel, Korea, as other countries that have moved rapidly. So over time, once you have history over six years, you can actually look at the movement progression of countries over time. You also see that the divide does actually exist in the world. So it is actually not unrealistic to, you know, in, in a sense to see that there is a big divide between countries that do well in innovation capacity, innovation results, and those that don't. And this innovation divide exists in different ways across the world. We also see that some gaps are being reduced today in, in the innovation metrics. So just to give you a sense, if you take a subset of these metrics and you just focus on a subset that talks about the quality of innovation and quality of innovation as being distinct from quantity of innovation, and we have some metrics that measure quality of innovation, you see that some of the leaders, the top 10 in the high income countries are USA, number one, UK, number two, Germany, number three, Japan, number four, Switzerland, number five, France, Canada, Sweden, Holland, and Korea. So again, you see that some of the more traditional players come up very strong in the metrics on the quality of innovation. 
Now, the quality of innovation, if you look at the middle-income countries, again, you see some interesting trends out there. The top 10, number one, China, number two, Brazil, number three, Russia, number four, India, and after that, Argentina, Mexico, South Africa, Malaysia, Chile, and Turkey. So you can actually look at the information and the data in different ways and come up with some interesting analysis that can provide some evidence-based analysis and decision-making for global innovation. So let me just stop out there and maybe hand over to the, back to the moderator. Um, Dean, thank you very much for that. And a very interesting point about innovation as a global game. And that as we take a look at uh, the fact we are discussing really the cross-border splitting of the value chain and we think about different opportunities to uh, take a look at the risks and reward crossing different borders than what normally show up on our corporate radar screens. Uh, so let me uh, go from that point to Professor Lee, who has got a, uh, a number of points to add uh, to this, uh, really building off of some areas that say, given what we just heard, uh, what are some interesting things that we can find around opportunities to develop value inside these, uh, uh, these value changes that cross borders? How? Okay, thanks, Leonard. Uh, let me share with uh, three thoughts. Uh, I just want to have three thoughts. First of all, that picture shows me having a whip. That's not what I teach. <laughs> I teach supply chain. I don't teach how to whip. Yeah, so so <laughs> that was a strange photo that Aaron picked. Uh, anyway, um, the three points that I want to share with you, or the three thoughts that I have, is really about, uh, first, I, I want to add some comment on the scope of innovation, and the second one would be about the sources of innovation, and the third one would be about the target of innovation. So first on the scope, yeah. I think this, this morning uh, when Sumitra was leading these panel discussions, uh, several of the panelists, especially like John Rice, talk about the importance that innovation is not about just the product, but also about process, about many, many other things. So for me, the focus that I think we all should uh, pay attention to is the value chain innovation. For every successful product, I think there is a successful and an innovative value chain behind it. This is similar to for every successful man, there is always a woman, right? Yeah, same, same thing. Uh, not same, but I mean, yeah, a value chain is not a woman. But the value chain supports the product. So in order for a product to be successful, oftentimes you have to think about what do you have to do to find the best way to manufacture, to integrate manufacturing with distribution, to do the customization, and eventually getting the right channel uh, to the right customers. And that involves innovation. Uh, I quote you the example of a very successful product that used to be, and now is facing big challenges, uh, of Crocs. Right? Crocs is a plastic shoe company. And the innovation is not the product. The product is, of course, it's an innovation is ugly. That's innovation, it's very ugly uh, shoe. I don't know why they're successful, but these days, uh, ugly shoes uh, sell. So, um, uh, funky, it's a funky product, but behind the product, they have to figure out how to manufacture. How do you do the right degree of outsourcing and in-house manufacturing, the right degree of offshoring, onshoring, etc., to figure out what is the right channel. So it's important. A successful product like Intuit that used to sell software put into the hardware, now they're not selling products because in order for them to be successful for their tax products, they were doing taxes directly for the customers. So in other words, they have converted themselves from a product-based company to a service-based company. So that's innovation. Innovation is, is really how a, the Israeli irrigation company, Nadafim, which I work with, and they were selling irrigation equipment for farmers. But many of the farmers could not make use of the sophisticated irrigation, drip irrigation uh, products. And so you have to help the farmers. And the way to help farmers is to make use of technologies. Technologies of getting sensors into the farm, into the field, getting the sensors to get the temperature, to get the pressure, to get the humidity, and then use the information back to the engineering office of Israel. And they would figure out what to do. When, is, when do you have to drip? How much to drip? What is the timing of the drip? And getting precise drip water so that we get more out of less, which is what this morning the panel, uh, when Sumitra was leading, is said, uh, how can we get more with less? That's value chain in innovation. And, and I think that's the scope that we have to expand way beyond just focusing on the product and the pure technologies. The second one is the source of innovation. Now these days, and I think this is also echoing some of the discussions that we have this morning, that innovation is not 
in, in the hands of the advanced economies. But in fact, it's also, I, I'm, I'm not using geography. I think maybe we should use the value chain perspective, is that sometimes the suppliers have innovation, have the ability to innovate, to help you. Um, I, I, I think of the example of when Microsoft came up with the first generation of the Xbox in 2001. The innovation was not totally created by Microsoft themselves. It requires them to combine the ability of uh, NVIDIA, of Intel, but more importantly, uh, the innovation coming from Flexronics. The manufacturer, it used to be a contract manufacturer, was able to complement uh, the, the original equipment manufacturer, uh, the ability to develop the product. Uh, Cisco, the most powerful Cisco router, uh, that they created in late 2008 was not a pure Cisco innovation. It was also an innovation that they were able to leverage Foxconn based in Sanjun and their collaboration creating the, the result. Yeah. That's what Esquel and Nike did. Nike, the, the, um, uh, of course, the shoe company too, but also uh, the apparel company, the most advanced uh, Nike product wrinkle-free um, golf shirt was not a Nike innovation. It was purely also working with a supplier who, based in China, was able to make use of the right ginning of the cotton and also the way to do the garment manufacturing, eventually the spinning, etc., to come up with a way to make a wrinkle-free golf shirt. So again, we must recognize that the sources of innovation come from your supplier, your contract manufacturer, your distributor, your customer, financially crowdsourcing, all are sources of innovation. And a company need to leverage all of those innovation in order for you to make the next big innovation. So the third one, the third topic that I want to share is uh, the target. So I was also struck by what Sam talked about yesterday during the panel about what Global Enterprises Institute is doing and also this morning, as Victor talked about the importance of disparity, I think the target of innovation should not be just the consumers of the advanced economy or the middle class. And we should start thinking about the target of innovation is to serve the underserved or the serve, to serve the, the markets that have been ignored. And those could be, of course, those could be in the developing economies, but they also could be in our own economies, because in our own economies, there are also target markets that have been underserved. And that's how I think some of the innovations that recently I've come across, and from, from Stanford University, of the students coming up with uh, D-Light, which is an extremely affordable uh, LED light to be sold in India, to be sold in Tanzania, embrace a baby warmer, extremely affordable. And that's required innovation. You innovate to have extremely affordable products. You also innovate process. That's how we are helping the farmers in Bhutan to grow hazelnut using mobile technologies to help the farmers, to shea butter farmers in Ghana to grow shea butter so that they can be made into cosmetic ingredients. And that's a process innovation as well. I think that's what, in fact, one of the most innovative sector that some of us, I think we should all learn from is the so-called the pirate cell phones, the Sanjais. Sanjais, uh, as some of us who uh, in from China, from Hong Kong may know about Sanjai. Sanjais are viewed as pirates. They were the one who really create copycat products. But in fact, some of them, not all of them are copycats. Men, some of them are just simply because there is an underserved market. There is a market that the traditional cell phone companies, Samsung, Nokia, are not serving. So they created products that are extremely, extremely affordable in China, in India, in Egypt, that they were able to reach those markets so that those farmers in Africa are able to enjoy the ability to be connected. So I think the target of innovation should also be expanded to serve the underserved. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Uh, for those of you in the audience that don't understand the bullwhip picture, uh, Hal wrote a very famous Harvard Business Review article in which he talked about the bullwhip effect, but I think Hal that uh, got a number of awards and is one of the best, uh, best articles that uh, I've seen come out of the Harvard Business Review in years. So Hal brings up a very interesting point uh, in terms of the final, uh, your final piece, your final third point about serving the underserved and looking 
beyond our own boundaries when we think about, uh, as we talk about the pirates in Shenzhen or the maker movement in Shanghai, uh, where we're looking at something very interesting. Uh, the maker movement in the United States thinks about making one product at a time. The maker movement in China takes a look at making 500 to 1,000 products at a time on the fly, very affordable. Uh, in a way that may end up serving the underserved market and one of the questions is what we can learn from them. So let me turn it over to Sam where I'm kind of beginning to move about the challenges to creating and sustaining this innovation culture both uh, inside the organization and the role that values create and competitiveness. Well, thank you, Leonard. And, and I was, I'll build up a little bit on what Hal was saying. I think if you uh, we can reflect on it, uh, it's basically if you look at innovation, it's all in concept, all encompassing, it's global, it's collaborative. So it touches everything, all encompassing, global, and collaborative. So what I thought I would do is back to the kind of the culture of it, but you need a spark. It, something has to spark it, right? I mean, ignite it, excite it. And that can come in a lot of different ways. Normally it comes out of a problem, at least I find in the business world, somebody is solving a problem. The Cisco model with Flextronics is a cost problem relative to an open source router offered by a Chinese company. They were solving, that was the spark. There was a threat, right? Uh, there's other ways to have threats that aren't always defensive threats or uh, you know, corporate structure threats. Uh, IBM's case, the GIE, was the evolution of a globalized world. But there was a spark. I would think if you think about ignition or sparks, I'd offer the idea now that there's a value chain of ideas. So many times when, and I mean Hal knows this, but many times when people think of supply chains or value chains, they think of hard goods. I mean, because we all run, if you're a corporation, you run a hard goods supply chain. Uh, that's what you do. You have logistics people and operation research people, manufacturing people. That's a core of what you do as a company. However, that Think about it as a globalized collaborative ecosystem of a spark of ideas. And I think a good analogy is what we did with IBM Research. So you need a bank to spark the idea. You can't do it without money. So Stanford has a big pot of money. They can spark a lot of ideas, right? Right, Hal? IBM has six billion that we fund in research. There's a lot of spark in those ideas. You need some flexibility in your business model that allows you to spark ideas. If you have no money, it's very hard to spark an idea because you have to experiment. Uh, that requires resources of some kind to experiment. At the same time, which we did, we found that what we needed to do back on collaboration and globalization is to take our research function and truly do that. Uh, we were always in seven or eight major research locations around the world, uh, Haifa, Zurich, Watson, Silicon Valley, um, Tokyo, Beijing, etc. But we decided what we needed to do was kind of globalize it and globalize it into the emerging markets, globalize it into Africa, expand our research facility in Delhi, etc., etc. But then take the research organization and shove it into the market and have it actually work on problems, traffic flows, clean water, sustainability, crime centers, uh, et cetera. By in doing that in the collaborative model with really three partners, uh, the client, some customer or some government, a university of some kind, because we needed to connect into the technical skills in a regional basis, and oh, by the way, if they weren't adequate at that point in time, we were going to have to build it to sustain it. So for operating something in Nairobi, you had to expand it and sustain it. You just couldn't do it because you were working on a traffic problem, let's say, or actually it was a clean water system. But, but fundamentally, you had to have that collaboration from some, some academic organization uh, to build the future skills that are required uh, and the client. And then obviously we had to move our people uh, to those locations. And so now if you look at it, and then you did it by content area. I mean. Uh, regions of the world that have great access to natural resources, you'd put a natural resource center. China decides that they're going to put $2 billion into rail. Well, you move your rail center from wherever to China. You know, you, you moved it to where there was uh, uh, a need, natural resources, exploration of natural resources, yield of natural resources, where there is a need, move people around the country, and $2 billion helps you focus on that. By the way, there's a big spark 
you know, right? That, that's, a, that's an economic spark, you know, to put people there and work on things. But I think the, uh, I would just kind of, kind of, I think I completely agree with everything our colleagues are saying, and that that's the nature of innovation today. And usually it comes out of a combination of solving a market need or a human need, the underserved populations of the world, and you, need, you do have to facilitate the spark. And we found out by facilitating the spark, you had to have the finding, a bank, and you had to have a culture that would facilitate the spark, a culture that would take some risk. Um, you know, an example is the, the machine, that, this Watson machine that did a television Q&A with a game show called Jeopardy in the United States. There was a spark of an idea, a guy by the name of David Fruch in a bar one night, uh, because I asked him why all this stuff he was inventing, nobody could understand, but they could understand the game. So, true story, so he's drinking, because that's what all great scientists do, uh, watching Jeopardy, uh, uh, and says, I could do that. And took all this translation, all this analytical QA, all the big data, all that stuff, and created this technology that actually won and competed and beat three human grandmasters of the game. But, uh, so, Big idea, now remember, uh, it was a multicultural team. It was, he, he interviewed people from all over the globe, hired 25 of them, um, and they, the criteria for the interview was, do you think you could do this? And if they said no, they, weren't, they didn't get the opportunity. If they said yes, that was it. That was the criteria of the interview. And then, yeah, and I had to give them 25 million bucks. But put that aside, you know, right? But that's, that's kind of how these things come together. So I think if you can step back, and I can clear a good house saying, Global, collaborative, ecosystem, value chain, okay, an ecosystem, but ignition, a culture that ignites the spark. Stanford has that culture that ignites the spark. I think, uh, Sam, thank you for that. And that's a wonderful segue to Richard Kelly, who uh, uh, comes out of IDEO, which is uh, before we uh, basically shanghai him, or I should say we got him out of Shanghai, so we Hong kong him uh, here to Lee and Fung. Uh, and uh, they are in the business, and he is in the business of lighting sparks. So, Richard, let's have a few bonfires. Okay. No pressure, right? Nope. After following Sam. Okay, so I, I actually, most of the, uh, the few of you that know me, most of the time I wing most of these things. This one I actually thought, actually, I would do a little research, and I thought about it last night for 10 minutes. <laughs> so, and some of this comes out of, and I have a bias here, so my, the bias here is that I've, I feel like I've been in the, in the trenches of doing innovation, um, and mainly in China for the last five years, as Leonard said, I've been in uh, China doing innovation for China with Chinese companies about China, for Chinese companies about going global, and less a degree because I was less interested in helping multinationals figure out how to deal with China because it was less interesting for us. So that, that's my bias. And so I have basically three or four things. I want to talk about risk uh, of innovation. I want to talk about rewards. Um, quickly talk about some insights, and then ideally get to, I have a set of questions, call them implications, call them what you will. So the, the risk of innovation for me is, is, again, I think Sam said it earlier, that everyone sees innovation as this sort of um, one directional line that goes from products and ends up in a marketplace. The reality of the world is it's, it's a network. And if you, so if you see that it's, it's this one chain of events that goes from one place and lands in another, that's not how it happens, and it's not gonna how it's happened, so you need to get that mindset gone. Um, secondly, that we live in exponential times. Everyone said it yesterday, um, and so we live in a series of ecosystems, and those ecosystems are moving a million miles an hour and are only gonna speed up. So it's omni-channel this, it's simultaneous, it's fast, it's global, and all of it, and it's about values and value, right? So all of that being said, the idea of a supply chain for me is language and mental models of an old industrial world versus a digital world which is much more about networks. And that's no bang on anyone, that's just for me a provocative thing to say around we just need a new set of mental models and therefore a new set of business models that are, uh, I think this is where Sam was going, which is sort of describe a much bigger world if you can take the business that you currently have and reframe it in a new pond then your values of who's creating the value and who's leveraging the value and who's receiving the value will be really different. So 
So the reward of those, that, that sort of idea of having a new mental model about networks and network innovation means that you will live. You won't die. Because the reality is either you're going to evolve or you're going to die. Um, and so if you can reframe some of your mental models and some of your business models, you're likely to evolve. And the question really comes how fast and how big can you evolve? Um, and so again, I'm less interested in the big stuff. I, I was super inspired by all the conversations yesterday about all these huge macroeconomic theories, et cetera, et cetera. I'm much more interested in the small thing. And the small things for me are about people. Peoples as humans, as individuals, that's for me is the place to find inspiration. It's because our, you know, it's a bias from IDI's point of view. So, you know, I, I think I heard lots of language around bottom up and, you know, the, the disadvantaged. I'm always, if, again, if you think about the network, it's hard to see where the bottom of the network is. So for me, it's outside in versus, versus at the bottom. But the idea is that the, the small things and people is where the, infra, uh, where the inspiration comes from. Mainly because um, the small things are about context, not about content. So businesses are focused on making things and creating business models that create other things. But people live in between ideas. I did a series of work for Motorola years ago, and th they were fascinated about creating a mobile device for home, mobile device for the car, and mobile device for work. And I was like, well, people go between those things. They live in between the stuff. And so it's the, it's the in-between, it's the context that counts. So a couple of insights then, if you think about individuals, they're either sort of consumers. So businesses are focused on them as consumers. And so I think about the world of co-creation, collaboration, open source innovation, that all of those ideas are one person's uh, consumer is another person's social entrepreneur. Most of the people that I know in Shanghai have at least three business cards, right? I'm a consumer at one point, I'm a social entrepreneur, and then, I'm, and then I have a day job. Um, second then, around businesses, again, the cost of being an entrepreneur has shrunk dramatically. So I, I think by the time we've, we've run this session, probably Aaron could have built a website and probably got revenue from it in the time that we're doing this. So the speed of those things happen. And then I think the, the last thing is then in the individual as humans as a citizen. So I think about Arab Spring and about how that very in a sort of um, non-centric kind of way, in a non-infrastructural way, was enabled to happen by social media, et cetera, et cetera. So I love the idea that sort of, again, that citizens, they see broken business models and they become social entrepreneurs because they believe they can do something. And, and actually, that's all about their values that they have. It's less about the value chain. It's more about the, the values that they can have. And, and, I, and so I think about things like Taobao, Everybody talks about Alibaba, but Taobao still, for me, is the one platform. If you think about the millions of people in China that enable them to move from, from not having anything to actually being able to sell from a peer-to-peer -peer way, it was a platform that enabled them to, to sell things to someone else. Sure, some of them might have been fake and all the rest of the stuff, I get that. But, it, it, but it, that's why Ma Yuan has become somewhat ingratiated with the culture in China, because he enabled lots of people to do what they wanted to do. He enabled you to pay. There are no credit cards in China. So all of those things have come out the necessity of change. Um, and so as I think about Asia and I think about people, I think of therefore, um, I didn't ask the question this morning because actually the lady from Hong Kong Poly asked the same thing, which was I, I'm fascinated fi or fixated at the moment about the next set of youth culture because the speed that we're talking about now is only going to speed up when the millennial generation really take hold of what we're doing. And so most of the, the constraints of innovation are held within the infrastructure. They're in government, in business, and in education. And, and what I'm really interested in is, as you look at millennials moving from this thing of, we are people of a different generation, that, that are, our meaning and our identity comes from a place of um, what, I, what I own, what I wear, and what I can control. And the millennials are much more about creating, building, and sharing. And so they have this innate idea that because they're digital natives, that they can actually make a difference in the world. And so the question for me then is, is if the infrastructure that surrounds um, innovation, most of the time, actually, it's about how do we get out of the way? How do we find and how do we get out of the way of people and then enable those things to happen? So clearly, I'm going to move to Moldova. And that was Moldova or Mali, I thought was interesting. So then. So, so again, it was a sort of the idea that they're creating and building is so I, I have kind of five questions that are as I would look at either our business or everyone else's, which would be 
to build off what Sam said, like, can you reframe your current assets and capabilities into a new, bigger, different pond? U ultimately, where you are, where your competition or also your future collaborators. Can you take a, can you look at that, those ideas as a portfolio of opportunities versus as a portfolio of risk? So again, lots of lo innovation comes around, around this sort of ideas of, of risk. As a designer, I'm much more interested in opportunities and optimism. Um, so, so what are you going to innovate and where? And then the idea of once you've got the idea of this much bigger network and the idea of um, you're not always going to win, but you're going to have shared value or blended value with parts of that network, then what are the implications for that? And what are you going to insource? What are you going to outsource differently? Because you're going to have to, or you're going to die. Um, and then how do you do that? How do you do risk that? I, I would ask a question of how many experiments are you running in a week? How many experiments are you running on a month? Whether you're Amazon or Intuit, which, which Hal um, talked about, or even in Liam Fung now, the idea of running experiments on a weekly, monthly basis is how you're going to learn, which leads me to the second point, or the sort of penultimate point, which is what is the infrastructure you have inside the business that enables you to learn? Because how are you going to learn and learn faster than everyone else is the thing that's going to make you win. Um, and ideally, you're going to learn with people. So I like Sam's idea of learning with the government, le learning, learning with your clients. Those things are create shared understanding and make things move faster. And as I think about IDEO's born out of Silicon Valley, it's one of those places. It, it's, a, it's a smashing of, of Silicon Valley optimism and, and European cynicism. It's kind of an interesting tension that happens all the time. Um, but it, but it, and that, that creative tension enables the thing to work. And so the spark that Sam talks about is the final thing. So again, the final question would be, where, where, how do you lead with inspiration and ideas versus leading through risk? So those are the sort of five questions I, I would ask business people or government people around, around the sort of new network of innovation. Sorry, I've got to take them up too much time. I'm not sure if those are sparks, but I could draw. But. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, before I go to the audience, let me turn to the panel with the last question. Uh, Richard talked about a lot about being at the edge. Uh, he talked at the end here about the millennial. And as I laugh about the fact that uh, I may be the oldest person in the room, and I don't know why I'm talking about millennials, uh, but uh, uh, he talks about also this issue of shared understanding and uh, leading to inspiration. And maybe I'd like to ask each of the panelists to comment a moment about, from their perspective, uh, what leads to inspiration. So, Andre? Yeah, so I think, you know, this issue of the spark and the inspiration is a very, very important point. Because my own observation in innovation is that innovation happens either out of desperation or out of inspiration. And clearly the challenge for us is to focus more on the inspiration side as opposed to less on the desperation side, while that can also lead to innovations. Now the question really is what inspires people? And I you know, refer back to perhaps an article that I read you know, I used to live in France for almost two decades. And some years ago in France, there was a fairly big riots. You know, and uh, they burned buses and cars and other kinds of stuff. They do it every year annually, but you know that there was one big one about five, six years ago. <laughs> so then there was an article in the Washington Post. And I forget the name of the author of that article, but I found the closing sentence of the article very interesting. So the author wrote that if you take a group of young French teenagers or young French adults, and you ask them a question, who is the Bill Gates of France? They will look at you with a blank stare. And the author continued to say that what is troubling is not that they don't know who the Bill Gates of France is. What is troubling is they don't know why the question is important in the first place. And I think this is very critical because I think what is important for young people today is this inspiration from role models. And you have these role models, of course, in the US, but increasingly in emerging markets like China and India, you ask young people today, and they can identify role models. And this issue of inspiration from role models is so critical. And I think innovation, you know, we have talked about the social element, but we should always remember that innovation has a very important social function besides satisfying needs. It's really giving hope to young people. 
because while the economic benefits of innovation are very clear, we talk about them and the GDP productivity are very elements, young people need hope. Young people need some way to create jobs. It's very well established today that the big companies of the world will not create the jobs that are needed today. The jobs will have to be created with the young people themselves. So innovation, entrepreneurship is the only way to go forward. And today, as was mentioned earlier, the cost of entrepreneurship has been decreased dramatically for many people. The cost of entry, the barriers to entry, have been reduced dramatically. And we really have to do what we can to celebrate successes, celebrate bright new young leaders who can act as inspiration role models of the next generation. Thank you for that. Hal? Um, I, I think this, this morning uh, we, we have a very good panel that uh, several questions were raised about the culture, right? the importance of culture, the education, and how can we get the young people to, to be inspired, to, to have this spark that uh, Sam talked about. And so let me give you an example, uh, a personal ex experience, is that this summer I went to Ghana. We set up an institute of innovation and entrepreneurship in West Africa. And we started working with entrepreneurs there, but we also spent time talking to high school students. And the interesting thing is that when we asked the high school students in Ghana, what would you like to be when you grow up? The majority of them says, I want to be a civil servant. A civil servant. Now, of course, I think, <laughs> I don't know whether there are civil servants here in the room. Yeah. Civil servants are great people and uh, yeah, very, very important. And, and, and I, with all the respect that they are the integral part of the society, but when the bulk of the high school kids says that I want to be a civil servant, I think that shows some, some potential issues. To them, is that that's a safe job. That is a stable job. If you ask students from Stanford, it's the other extreme, which I think is also a problem. You ask students, everyone says that I want to start a company. They don't know what they're doing, and they haven't learned how to do a startup, and they want to say, we'll start something. Something will come up. Yeah, so that's extreme. Both are bad, I would say, but, in, 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 but to be able to receive that spark that Sam talked about, I think we need to be sensitive. We have to train people to, so that those high school students need to have an aspiration. So that I would be sensitive to the needs, I would be sensitive to the opportunities, and so when that opportunity comes, I'll be able to seize it. So the spark would not come naturally. The spark is there because you were aware and you were looking, you were seeking, and you have that aspiration to seek. And I think that's important. The second one is that I like what Richard said about the, the importance of a network. So most of us, when we think about, okay, web, I'm inspired, I want to do something big and innovate, you recognize that you don't innovate all by yourself because it's too big a job. You want to create something different. It's actually impossible for a single person, a single entity to create it. But if I know that I have a network to rely on, I am fine out from the network to help me to do that rapid experiments that Richard was talking about. Uh, that there are companies these days that are helping you to do rapid experiments. Quirky is a company that says that you have an idea, I'll help you to launch it, I'll help you to experiment. And so you don't need to do the whole thing yourself. You rely on the network for innovation. Then it lowers the risks, it lowers the cost, and then you'll be able to seize it. So I think that for the young generation, we need to create that, not the culture, but I would say is to have that aspiration. People who have the aspirations and to recognize that they can leverage the network to provide them with the means to do the innovation. That's the way to accelerate innovation, I hope. Sam? Yeah, uh, I would just um, take a little different dimension on it and take, take a dimension of an enterprise or an institution, whatever you want to be, and put yourself as a city, a government, or a company. I think in today's environment, you have to stand for something more than what you are defined to be. Stand for something more than what you're defined to be. A business, you have to be more than making money. Making money today is not adequate to attract talent. So you have to find something. And that gets back to innovation. So I'll give you two examples. You can find it in your business model. Globally Integrated Enterprise, we created something that didn't exist in IBM. So people could see they were moving to the future. So all the process innovation, all the things, all the globalization, all those things, was creating something that didn't exist. At least we couldn't find it. As Sumitra might recall, because I asked him if he knew of one. We couldn't find it, so we convinced 400,000 people it was good to go try to create it. 
Another one is, we, uh, another example I'm familiar with was Smarter Planet at IBM. We, we searched for years of something that could integrate and stand for something beyond a mobile computer called a ThinkPad. I mean, a ThinkPad or a great phone today, I don't think is going to ignite people to leave Stanford, Cornell, Harvard, and say, I want to work at IBM. Smarter Planet, solving societal problems, that works. Water, energy, crime, healthcare, curing cancer, that saving babies in Toronto, that works, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so you need to, as you, as you think about yourself, an enterprise, a city, an institution, you have to think about what you can uniquely do to stand for something beyond what society has defined you to do. And that will be a hugely attractive force. Now, I'm going to take exception that large companies don't create employment. Now, I admit I know all the statistics on SMEs and all the job growth of SMEs, and I can recite them. So I got it. Put that aside. I know of a company that created 100,000 jobs in three years in a country. I know a company that went from 500 to 30,000 in three years in a country. So large companies can create jobs. So don't throw them out with the bathwater. Well, I wouldn't call a large company a baby. We definitely don't want to throw it out <laughs> with the bathwater. Um, how did you have a comment, uh, Richard? Or Richard, a comment before we go out to the audience? Um, I actually only have I have two quick things. One to build on what Sam talked about. I think one of the more leading edge things that I left at IDEO was this notion about purpose and profit. So I, I, I'm always I, I love the idea of you have to have. I, I'm not a big fan of CSR because I always think it's it's an also thing over there versus it should be part core part of your business. And so having a point about what you're trying to do in the world actually enables people to kind of come on the path. And so uh, as far as you know solving problems of the world, that's why people join IDEO. Um, and, and so then the, the other p part of it, which is maybe slightly different, which is as I think about companies, infrastructure, whether companies, government, cities, whatever, the piece of uh, I think the hardest thing to either teach or the hardest thing to learn is curiosity. So curiosity for me is the thing that at, at the core of all cool ideas is this notion, and I actually you said it I think yesterday, was like y y you have to kind of have this idea that there's something interesting out there. And it kills the cat. I I'm constantly like, oh, there's something interesting over there in Moldovia, right? But so the idea is can you teach curiosity, right? Can you actually get people to see, not just to learn about big data, et cetera, et cetera, but can you teach them to, to learn how to learn? And learning how to learn, I think, is the thing that we ultimately, again, there was this conversation this morning about, about playing. Curiosity enables play, and play enables curiosity, and it enables people to learn. And so if, there's, if there was one place that I would want to focus a lot of Asian talent would be on how do we teach our kids how to play much more? Um, and then what they're learning and what they're playing with actually would become super interesting. So it would enable people to become curious a lot more, because everyone would ask why. Uh, good, thank you. Uh, so I want to go out to the audience with a couple of things. Uh, just so summarizing just some headline points. Uh, we've talked about innovation uh, in terms of being global, about being collaborative, about having the spark, about having an inspiration, about something that is beyond how we define ourselves, uh, whether it's uh, people, planet, profit, or as uh, Joe Santos talked to us here a week ago, uh, I have to mention we bring in I MIT along with Harvard and, and Cornell. Uh, about not only about value in terms of value to the customer, value to the people in the communities we operate in, and value to nature of preserving the planet. Um, I want to take all of those and the last two points about not only learning how to learn, but I would add you one more challenge within the value chain. How do we unleash the power of that learning in different parts? And turn it over to the audience to see any comments or thoughts you have. Thank you. It's me again, since I was mentioned just now. Um, I couldn't agree with all of you more. Um, but That's I dangerous if you can't agree with it. We've got to have a differing opinion here. Don't worry, okay. I'll come. Worry. <laughs> I'm a controversial type, being an academic. Um, I'd like to link education and innovation. Um, this is very dear to my heart. Um, I'm the first generation to be educated in Hong Kong. Very much rote learning. and. And let me link to 
um, what we're experiencing here. Um, speakers mentioned about millennials, right? Um, mentioned about the young generation, um, network innovation. I'm going to be very controversial. I learned from my kids. They keep telling me, Mom, you don't know the world out there. And I say, yes. So this one and a half days, our average age is probably 45 attending this conference. Why are we ignoring the really smart young people? Why are they not here? And what about diversity? I really believe that in order to be global and collaborative, we need to show diversity. It was mentioned earlier. Have we got any speakers who are women, who are young, who can really tell us about network innovation, who represent Silicon Valley? Um, so I thought that the controversial part is we must tell ourselves, no matter how young or old we are, to be role models to keep learning. And ourselves, as I mentioned, we must keep learning. And we must overcome our own obstacle, our own infrastructure. I'm old. I know best. I'm the mother. I'm not your peer. And then for organization to keep learning, to keep having our own curiosity, to keep organization learning. So I'd like to throw this to share with you that the controversy and the provocative way is, are we setting ourselves as good role models? We are always telling, I'm always telling my kids, this is what you should be doing. You cannot make mistakes. But are we learning from our failures? So I think these are million dollar questions. And are we able to throw away our own infrastructure our education system, which has invested so much around the world, how do we capture the best? From the West, we have diligence, we have discipline, but we don't have a lot of openness and our fear against failure. Whereas in the US, they also don't have what we have. So how do we make it global and make it a global learning community where we are, I myself must be open and get away from the fact that I'm a mother and I'm a professor, I still learn. Thank you. Very good comment, thank you. Any, uh, before I ask the next question to the audience, I wanna just reinforce that from a talk, talk from the, your, your morning panel. Someone asked, you asked this morning, can we recreate Silicon Valley? And what I urge you all to do, and so Dean, I'm gonna give you a reading, I'm gonna give you a homework assignment, and to Hal also, uh, because of from Hal's backyard. There's a wonderful book written called Regional Advantage by Anna Lee Saxon. And, and she talks about how the Silicon Valley arose versus Route 128 in Boston. The incredible difference was in the Silicon Valley, for the whole series of reasons they put in the book, they overcame the fear of failure. In Route 128, they didn't. Uh, so I'd like to go out and see a few more hands out in the audience. Comment uh, in the back. I'm the back. OK, uh, Yuval Escate from WTO. Um, we did escape from the WTO, and we had to, we escaped from statistics, and we made this fun. I won't speak about statistics. Well, uh, I spent almost all my career in developing countries. I'm very much interested by the, this session, but I think it's very Californian, I will say. Uh, you're speaking about the first of the class here. We have to be at the front. We have to innovate. You innovate or you die. Well, a bunch of people, they live in the back like me, uh, in, in many developing countries, and this is my question, they have two schools in developing countries, at least the developing countries I know in Latin America. Some people are a bit like you. We have to innovate, it costs money, and we have to invest in PhD program, etc. Other people, usually more business people, say innovation in developing countries is uh, open source. In fact, for a firm in developing country to be able to qualify for a global supply chain, most of the thing this firm has to do is already open source. I mean, you have to improve your quality, you have to adopt the best practice. So my question is, 
not for the Californian people, but for the rest of the world. What is the mix between open source innovation, things that cost no money, and the, the, the real investment in being really innovator in new products, new things? So there's a couple, there are two of us, two people here that are not from California. So it's either going to be Sam or Sumatra. So either one of the two of you would like to answer the question. I'd start by looking at it as a continuum of innovation or a continuum of time. And by that I mean there are phenomenally great ideas in the open source world that could, should be built upon. You should view that as only the foundation of a building block. And then you could innovate to scale and have job creation, economic return on top of that building block. Uh, there are lots of examples of that. I mean, I, uh, not to get too technical. Uh, today, the, the, the data structure for big data is a thing called Hadoop. It was invented by Yahoo. It is open sourced. There's going to be billions, if not trillions, made on top of the data structure. Every domain of content will use that data structure, but there will be tremendous value chains created on top of that. There was a product at IBM called WebSphere that was built on top of Apache, right? I mean, that now is probably a four or five billion dollar business built on top of an open source module. So if you can think of innovation that, oh, and this applies to, I don't care if you're in Latin America or, or on the North Pole, it doesn't matter today. All you need is smart people, right, and an educational environment that continues to encourage that level of uh, uh, human capital development. And you can take the world's ideas wherever you happen to be and build upon them. And a lot of what goes on in Silicon Valley is, and not, we all know, although I'm, not, I'm from New York or live in Connecticut, it is built off that model. There's a huge amount of innovation on top of some form of core open source, that happens to be software, but some core open source foundational build. Can I just make a couple of comments? I see a colleague has not there, or she's sat somewhere else, one who asked a question. Sorry, she's stepped out, or? Okay, so the, the issue of education, educational reform is very critical. At the same time, we have to keep in mind that really there is no fundamental difference between people anywhere in the world. If you take a four-year-old in China, in Africa, in US, in India, and you look at how a four-year-old child behaves, a four-year-old child typically constantly observes the environment around him or her, is always asking questions. Sometimes the parents get tired of answering questions, but it's constantly asking questions. It's constantly experimenting, making mistakes, getting hurt, but constantly experimenting. And when the child needs help, has a support network to go to, the parents, the siblings, the you know, other kinds of maybe peers. Now, these kinds of behaviors observation, questioning, experimentation, having a support network are really the behaviors that research has identified as being the behaviors of innovative people in businesses. So the question really is, a four-year-old has the behaviors naturally, what happens in between? And that's the big question. I think education has to answer that question in terms of how well or how poorly are we doing in supporting that and letting those natural behaviors you know, flourish. On the issue of, let's say, emerging markets, which is something which really is very important to some of the research that I do, I would, if you allow me, just use the word open source in a little bit more broader sense, not in the technical sense in terms of software. I think if you look at the research on the IBM, I think your IBM is still launched research about where do new ideas come from? The new ideas come from outside the company, you know, come from employees, come from well, outside, in a sense, in terms of not the R&D department, comes across the company, from customers, from business partners. And the challenge is to be able to take the ideas and convert them and, trans and transition them into useful products and services. So I don't think companies today, whether it's emerging markets or in developed markets, have a shortage of ideas. The critical constraint is leadership, to be able to take the risk and to be able to invest smartly. In many cases, when I talk to company leaders in Brazil, for example, they tell me that, look, the company, the government has put a law on uh, incentives, you know, tax reduction for investment R&D, but the tax law is so unclear, it's, I'm unclear in terms of do I actually get tax incentive or not for making that investment. So clarity, 
certainty, I think, can go a long way also in terms of helping private sector investment. And clearly, the need for encouraging more private sector investment in many of the emerging markets where typically most of the investment are R&D tends to be government driven. Great. Thank you. Uh, there's been a couple of questions in the back, so how, if you'll permit me a moment, the gentleman. Uh... Yes. Um, you know, I come from a region as, uh, in Karachi in Pakistan. We are really next to the Gulf where the global value chain ends and then our own global chain, our own value chain starts. Because in uh, Dubai, we get all the latest of the world. And in our part of the world, even the government controlled infrastructure like 2G and all of this, and even uh, your YouTube and all is restricted sometimes. But the question is that if there is a moral argument on whether the value addition in biological terms is going to continue in your part of the world, whether that is an argument in our part of the world, okay? And uh, this is something you have to really think about because really you're just an extended activity center based on a supply chain that's been established for many, many years so you can afford to play around. This opportunity was not in my part of the world and we didn't get it. Just much like, because obviously your Pacific contiguity it was very, very good. What we see is that uh, perhaps uh, we may take a different direction from you uh, because we have to coexist with a lot of humanity and not the value and we cannot afford the cost. And one of the things that, that, that I found in your discourse here was the cost element was not discussed. But what Mr. Lee said about this Ghanaian civil servant Aspect. This is the same aspiration in my part of the world where the young people want to change things and the only way to change things is the government. At the same time, the governments are very aware that this infrastructure, or what you call cloud computing and all of this is part of their regulatory authority and hence the argument of the WSIS and the internet governance and the infrastructure and all of this is going to be an issue. But if you think that this is going to be a compensation that uh, the young youth who are unemployed will suddenly find a vocation and suddenly sustain themselves. I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether that puts food really on the table. I mean, does the food supply chain, how that affects? I mean, these are some of the questions I'd like to ask. Okay, how, how does that happen? I mean, okay, you get a good restaurant directory and maybe even I can locate a restaurant very easily. But, uh, but, but, but is that going to increase productivity in food? Is that going to change the situation in medic Medicare uh, care where, you know, there's a genetics issue, where there's a clone issue? These are all issues which are also technology-based. And how, how far are you going to take that? Or are we going to merge this both? These are, I'm sure, questions that must have come up in your research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. So Bar is that Barbara back there with the hand? Um, I would just like to make an observation from an individual's perspective uh, on innovation. And basically, I just wonder whether it has anything to do with the culture of society and the way individuals respond to success and failure. Because in certain parts of the world and in, in some countries, uh, failure is not really accepted or is not acceptable. Um, I'm reminded of what Henry Ford said that, um, you know, embrace failure because it's learned from it. It's just an opportunity for you to learn to do, the ne to do it more intelligently the next time round. That's what he said. But many people in other parts of the world define success as something highly desirable and failure not as an opportunity to learn to do it more intelligently, but it's a reflection on their own achievement and performance. And perhaps this is where education has a role to play. Good. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question right here. I was talking on Friday to one of the discoverers of graphene, and th they're a fascinating story about innovation. They were very playful. You know, they found graphene with sellotape, uh, got them the Nobel Prize. Um, but he was profoundly pessimistic about the future of innovation coming from companies. Uh, I mean, really quite shockingly so. He, he said that whereas in the past, 
you know, some of the great companies with great research labs, such as IBM, uh, you know, were doing lots of very fundamental work, which then had widespread application. A lot of the work in research has now become very much applied. And I think that the, the problem we have to worry about is we talk about the risks and rewards of innovation, but notoriously, the rewards of innovation don't necessarily accrue to the innovators, or at least not the financial rewards. And you need somehow to internalize the externalities of this. There are, are otherwise, if every company focuses solely on profit maximization, then some of the really beneficial innovations to society, whether it's fundamental R&D, or whether it's some of this open source stuff, go away. So somehow you've got to get the policy balance right for this innovation ecosystem to work genuinely, as opposed to just sort of cute ideas to make money that don't really change the world very positively. Thank you. Um, I'd like now to uh, finish the, the, uh, the morning by asking each of our panelists for perhaps about a one minute uh, wrap up on their thoughts on uh, what we've discussed here during the last 80 minutes. And so I'm going to go to the other end, Sam. I'm going to start with you and work back this way. Well, the uh, uh, last statement um, that, our, that our friend made about, you know, uh, long-term research versus applied research and financial incentive not to invest in R&D. Um, and I think, like everything that you have to view this, it's a chance to change that discussion. That discussion can be changed. I, you know, I lived uh, as a public CEO for 48 quarters at 17% compounding earnings, right, for 48 quarters. So I got it, okay, I understand short-term pressure. My point being, you can sell the case, but you have to want to sell the case. It, uh, I, you could sell the case, we gave this Wall Street a five-year financial model from 2005 through 2010, then 2010 through 2015. We sold the case, it took a while, didn't buy it the first year, I mean, I got all that, right? The stock went from 83 to 210 when I left. Eventually they got it. So you can sell the case. The example I gave on creating a new school in New York yesterday when I was in the panel, you can sell the case. You can create a completely different thing. But it takes people, uh, like Richard would say, that think outside of their domain and define themselves as something bigger or different that will do that. And that's quite honestly, I think, is the ingredient to all these things we discuss. Some individual was going to come along. I mean, in our case, IBM convinced Wall Street to think in more than 90-day cycles, and now a lot of people were doing it. But somebody had to do it, you know. And so, and you couldn't, if you failed, nobody would copy you. <laughs> it happened to work in our example. So I, I fundamentally plead because the solution to a lot of these issues that we're discussing is innovation at the end of the day. It's human capital and it's innovation at the end of the day. That is the solution, and you have to sell the case. And I believe, you know, maybe naively so, because I'm an American optimist, but I do believe you can sell the case. Hal? Well, thank you. I uh, want to comment on the point about the California way versus the open source way. And there is no California way, actually. You know, because if you think about California, California Silicon Valley 30 years ago, 40 years ago was nothing. And that required the, the, the location, the region, to innovate and try to come up with a new way of doing so-called innovation. And because at that time, 30 years ago, the center of the gravity of economics is in the Northeast. So the same thing, which is why Silicon Valley is an example of, of going around, like what Sam's talk about these schools and so on, is that they have to create their own version of the ecosystem to allow for innovation. So I think that is the model that we'll use in Ghana. That's the model that I found in Bhutan. That's the fine, I mean, Pakistan as well, is that they have to find their own way of doing innovation. It may be a harsh innovation. It may be an extreme affordability, or maybe it require working with the government, but they have to find their path, and it cannot be an import of the Silicon Bay, uh, Valley Bay or any other uh, kind of way. They have to find their own path. But I have seen enough examples that when the people, the local people are able to leverage the network and be able to learn from the constraints and overcome the constraints, I've seen the potato farmers in India. I found the shea butter farmers in uh, Ghana and the hazelnut farmers in Bhutan. They were able to do wonder. So innovation 
cannot be an import thing, but innovation, innovate in your own way, leveraging the network, there's still great future. Richard? Okay, <clears throat> so I would say, and actually building on what Hal said, that um, I think the word innovation for me is, I, I feel like it's been overused, and so it's one of those things, it makes sense in a business sense, and it makes sense in infrastructure and all of those other things. It's hard to innovate if you're hungry, right? So, so the language of innovation needs to change when it gets down to the level of, how do I change the plow from this to this in order to feed myself? So I, I'm very conscious of, but most of the language that we talked about here was not, not about that. So I want to be clear, like Hal, because I've spent enough time out in the world. I mean, I've lived, I live in China. I've spent enough time to know what it means and actually to be on the ground and have people, you know, they don't have computers, right? So, so that's, that's one thing. And then second thing was, um, I guess in summary, I, I go back to the, the notion of maybe it's a, quote from Muhammad Yunus, who's one of my heroes, who said that the um, burning eyes are the business eyes of the future. People have passion about the problems and whether you're the farmer in Pakistan or whether you're a, a Shanzai guy in Shenzhen ripping off a bunch, hacking off a bunch of things. Most of the, 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 pa the passion you have is the thing that's going to drive your curiosity. It's going to drive the, to, for you to make the right decisions and all of those things. So for me, it's about burning eyes. Ask yourself, do you have burning eyes about something, anything, and then go do that. Yeah. Sumatra? So I'll make two very quick points. The first one is, goes back to the country data that I gave you earlier. I know that some of the countries might seem unfamiliar to you, but if you're really interested in global assessments of innovation capacities, capabilities, you might want to take a look at the data because there's really a lot of hard data out there that you can analyze for strengths and weaknesses. So it's not just you know hearsay and what people think in terms of opinions. It's really hard data. It can make you have the right investment decisions. The second element is really linked to what I think creates innovation, and I think the major element really out there is leadership. I'll give you a short insight into one major innovative project that I'm involved in personally at Cornell University, which is this whole applied sciences initiative of Mayor Bloomberg at, at New York uh, City, because Mayor Bloomberg realized he had to help transform the economy of New York City. So in a very strong element of leadership, he had a worldwide competition to invite major universities in, you know, Stanford, Cornell, other people participated. Cornell happened to win, it's great news for Cornell. And now really what is happening is the unique ecosystem being created between an educational institution, in this case Cornell, the private sector, the local city government, and civil society. And there are new innovations being created out there which are fundamentally hopefully transformational. So just a small element of it, professors at Cornell Tech are being required to teach in the local high schools in New York City. I'm just giving one small snippet, but it's a way in which you create an innovative ecosystem for innovation. You need leadership for that. Without leadership, it doesn't happen. So thank you very much. I have kind of a couple, one final statement here that I've been writing as it goes, we go along, and it appears that out of all of the discussions we've had today, over the last day and a half, whether it's policy, reducing the frictions, uh, getting the transaction costs out of the way of having a, uh, the supply chain turn into a value chain and create value for the people that are in it, for the countries, for the nature that's involved, whether it's the, uh, the practices of the leaders, uh, both at the country, at the national level, at the local level, and within the company level. Uh, my closing statement from this panel is all around finding within your own culture how you're going to unleash the power of learning. So with that, I'd like to thank our panel for everything, and thank you for being here this morning, and good lunch. Thank you.